Goddag og hjertelig velkommen til et øh, lille PowerPoint-foredrag og forhåbentlig en god... Øh, sorry. No, I, I need you to practice a little bit. That's how it is to be traveling out in the world. You sort of meet people who says, egg, bottle, tanda, bani. And you say, what? And that's a bottle of cold water in India. Anyway, part of doing what I do, I'm an investigative uh, journalist and a filmmaker, and I've done documentaries both for radio and television for the last some 20 years, uh, mostly on issues concerning uh, Danish, Swedish, Norwegian companies involved in production of textiles or stones or whatever in the third world countries. And uh, we have tried to test, and that's what I'm doing, it's trying to test Uh, the famous way of expressing uh, walk your talk when uh, when the Norwegian or Danish companies brag about how how good a social compliance company they are and how much they value uh, social responsibility and ethical uh, trading and uh, the environment I'm there to fact check them uh, and mostly I'm I'm right there's something wrong it's it's not rocket science it's actually dead easy journalism. But there are some obstacles and there are some issues that I have learned over the years uh, to sort of um, to make it better and more easy for me and also uh, to do some uh, essential and necessary uh, security assessments on the people I involve out there because I cannot be there all the time. No editor will pay me uh, to stay out to do my stories eternally. Uh, so sometimes I, I have to uh, rely on on other people's uh, good help, and uh, that I of course pay for, but but also uh, sets me in some difficult situations sometimes. Let me just give you an example uh, from my, from my latest series I did with uh, Mr. Erling Borgen, who sits down here, uh, called "A Heart That Never Dies." Some of you might have seen some of the films in, on Wednesday night. Um, It's about people who is doing a difference, who is fighting for democracy and freedom of speech. And uh, we actually found a, a very nice, uh, a very good and uh, solid editor in Colombia. And Erling uh, is a former correspondent in South America, so he speaks fluently Spanish. And he was on his way, actually, down there. When uh, our good friend and editor down there, he received this in his mailbox, personally. And we should go... We have some sound. This was given to the editor in his private uh, mailbox on a CD-ROM, along with two, sh two uh, empty cartridges, but no letters, no anything. He was doing stories on the drug cartels. What do you do when your main source receives things like that? You have to drop the story, because we cannot, we cannot justify to do the story with this guy when we know that he will probably be killed before we're even done with the footage. Um, so there's... There is always and constantly something you have to think about. And um, bringing that to a, a in Norway, very well-known story about how a big state-owned company called Telenor here in Norway produced their telecom towers in Bangladesh. I cannot just go there uh, to do my research. I don't have the funding for that. So you have to sort of get, um, get your fixer in motion. Um, and also talk with him. So he should be my eyes and ears. And um, then I can go back to my, my editors at various TV stations and say, I have this really good story, and I'm, I'm sure that we can, uh, we can prove this story. And before that, I'll sort of... Uh, hi, Said. He's a very good uh, fixer for me in, in uh, Bangladesh, and if you ever need a good fixer in Bangladesh, do write me and I will uh, see to that you will uh, get in touch with him. And that goes for many of my other fixers that I can, I've helped them a lot of time. So I'm asking, basically, Said, 
to be my eyes and ears. Are there something in this story? I've been in Bangladesh so many times in my life that I know there is something into this story. But can we get access to it? Can we get in? Can we, can we sort of, you know, what I call hit and run television? It's like either playing a game, come into the factory, film, document as much as you can, and get the hell out of there. That's hit and run television for me. Um, it wasn't that difficult to, um, to find the uh, actual factories because some of them actually bragged about it on their websites. They were, you know, trying to promote their own company by bragging about saying we are supplying European uh, buyers from Telenor, from Grameen Phone, which is uh, the Telenor subsidiary in, in Bangladesh. And Ericsson's is a major player in, in Far East Asia also when it comes to comes to um, um, this network uh, base station things that they sort of hang up in the uh, the masts you see all over the world. So we found I found quite quickly these uh, five companies. So um, and I sent uh, Said out there, of course, talking about you know how careful he should be and be anonymous and start drinking tea outside the factories and meet the workers and see uh, if there's something turning up, sort of snooping around, as you say. And uh, Said rather quickly went, com came back with a, after a visit, uh, Confident Steel outside Dhaka, the main capital of Bangladesh. And replying to my questions, yeah, there were a few child laborers. Yes, they were paid this and that. There was no, even though that some had boots and helmet and gloves and blah, 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 mostly didn't use them, blah, 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 blah. Um, so this is a very good little storyboard uh, for thinking that, so now we're going to film this. Otherwise, we have no story. We, it doesn't, uh, doesn't fit anything else. If we, if we can't get pictures or documents or footage of any kind to prove this story, we have no story. That's, uh, so I had to prepare myself um, to, uh, to know how to galvanize steel. I don't know anything about galvanization processes, but I knew that if I should have a chance to get into that factory with a reasonable silly story that I'm being a, a scientist from Denmark investigating uh, various uh, galvanization process in the aim to reduce costs for local factories, I had to know, I need to know how you galvanize steel and what kind of language do these galvanizers use by, you know, the layers, how many layers do you give it? And if you, of course, do not use lead in galvanization process, they all do that out there. This is illegal. But anyway, so I went to Sweden. There's a big galvanization factory there, and we filmed there to see how it should be done when it's okay. That's where they galvanize the bottom plates for all the Volvos in, uh, in Sweden. Um, so we went there and uh, had a really nice talk with a with a sort of production manager, I think he was, and um, he taught me a lot. Uh, not only did we were allowed to film in this factory, we were also given all the right words, as much as I could pick up in one day's uh, work. And uh, I had to make a reasonable cover story, because we had to go to Bangladesh, we had to get into Confident Steel, uh, and that's key issue. So uh, I got a new name. Uh, Hans Henrik Nielsen came out straight out of the air. I was just like finding out something. And uh, I named myself Research Scientist. And uh, it happened so that my wife is also my camera woman. And uh, in this case, she was my uh, beautiful blonde assistant. And we were traveling all over Southeast Asia to, uh, to document uh, the galvanization process in order to improve and by that make the factory owners make a lot of money in reducing the amount of galvanization. Zinc, lead, cadmium, the things that you mix it with so it doesn't rust. So I got this name and my business card, and that didn't take me quite many seconds to do that, and just a silly email because I knew they would never mail me anything. This was just an access to my, to my entry. And... Um, and I said that uh, I represented a professor in Copenhagen who was very interested in researching on this. So that's why I brought my assistant, and she brought a little camera, not a big broadcasting camera. 
that's too big. I never travel with big cameras like that because that's too flashy. Uh, we attract too much attention. So we are working on small cameras. And we have also have another uh, trick that I could share with you is that if you are doing hit and run television as this is, it's like Lotte, my wife, she has to film all the bad things, the chemical waste dumps, the child laborers, everything that they don't want us to see. So she, when I walk, I normally walk with the production manager or some leading man from the factory. He's showing me around and I'm really curious and I'm walking quite fast with him. And Lotte will fall back and turn the camera to the right angles. So we went there and went to this factory. This is Confidence Steel. Can you see or should we turn on the lights or off or what? No, it's okay. This is where 22-year-old Bilal lost his life. We presented a detailed account of what we'd filmed in and outside the factory to the director of Confidence Steel, Imran Karim. He admits that Bilal died after a tragic accident, claiming, though, that he hadn't fallen into an acid bath, but into a vat of boiling water. Imran Karim denies there having been other fatal accidents at Confidence Steel and tells us that Confidence Steel doesn't have employees under 18. He claims the children we filmed weren't employed at the factory, but by subcontractors. The same applies to the workers crawling up the mobile towers without safety equipment. Imran Karim says this isn't Confidence Steel's responsibility either. <coughs> isn't it amazing, that picture there? It was done from outside the factory on a, on a rooftop. They didn't see us when we filmed this. Um, so now we got a story. But it's a, is it enough? Is it enough to prove that Telenor and uh, Ericsson's are violating their own ethical rules? To my point of view, it's not. We have to get more footage. We have to get more evidence. We have to go to uh, some other factories. Um, and what I normally do is um, that I wait with my confrontations until I have secured my tapes or my cards, my hard disks, that they, when they are in a secure place, I will then pursue the confrontation either when I'm there or when I'm back in Denmark with my uh, equipment. And then I might either go out there or confront them on, on via an email. I, I will show you in a minute. But we went to another factory, and this was quite funny because then I felt a little bit more confident uh, about, you know, can I actually say who I am? And this particular factory we went to was called Power Trade. Um, that particular factory also bragged a lot about working for GP, that's Grameen Phone, uh, one of the Grameen companies run by Mr. Mohammed Yunus um, at that time, uh, before we got him fired. Anyway, Powertrade bragged about working for Telenor and, and Ericsson's. So I th thought about another trick I could do. I simply go there and say I'm a journalist and I think it's a fantastic story that this huge factory and beautiful factory is producing for Scandinavian companies. Can I film this? And after a long sit in the managing, uh, managing office, that's where you normally are seated the first hour until they have cleaned up a little bit, you drink a lot of tea, and you chit-chat about nothing or anything, and then you finally are let in, and we were also let in. The funny thing about this clip is that in the Bangladeshi language, there is no word for a Bangladeshi word for a helmet, a safety helmet. It's called a helmet. Helmet. So before we are let into this factory, there's a funny little sequence here you will see. Hello, my name is Tom Heinemann. Yeah. I'm a journalist. Could you bring my uh, personal regards to Mr. Jaman that, yes. that organized this? So please say yes. no. thank you very much to him also. Power Trade's managing director. Let me just, oh, sorry. I have to f just tell you one thing. In this particular factory, I'm l mic'd up with a, with a hidden camera and a hidden microphone. Because if Lotte were supposed to be stopped, and I thought she might be, I could go on documenting because this was a major uh, supplier for these two uh, Scandinavian companies. 
Sorry about this. You'll get it from the start. Hello, my name is Tom Heinemann. Yeah. I'm a journalist. Could you bring my uh, personal regards to Mr. Jaman that, yes. that organized this? So please say no. thank you very much to him also. Power Trade's managing director gave us permission to see the factory, but we can't enter the hall until everyone's been given a helmet. Helmet in Corona, everybody. Everybody, helmet. This happens every time they receive visitors from the West, such as Ericsson and Telenor. <laughs> and the buyers from the West allow themselves to be duped. Uh, helmet, Jute, plus Amadir Ported, the Genji, that. Jakon Kono, Purdishokase, Kono, Bayashe, Kono, Mane, Kumpane, Boregato, Kono. These are the galvanization and acid baths. Apart from shiny helmets, some of the workers have also been provided with dust masks. degrees Celsius hot, this galvanization thing. It was in a bath like this that 22-year-old Bilal lost his life. The smallest of mistakes can lead to a disaster. Less than half an hour after we left, the workers had removed their helmets and safety equipment again, and everything was back to normal. More than 6,000 networks and towers have been manufactured under these conditions. Nonetheless, the film comes as a shock to Telenor. We are now nødt til å se på det som er blitt forelagt oss, som sjokkerer oss, og som er totalt uakseptabelt. Og det vi ser er at dette er ikke i tråd med regelverket til Telenor, det er ikke i tråd med de kontraktene vi har med leverandørene, det er ikke i tråd med bangladesisk lov, og ikke i tråd med internasjonal lovgivning, som vi har kommentert oss til. That, of course, caused quite a story in, in Norway. Uh, the Norwegians here in the room can probably remember that. There was a big, uh, big, big, big media debate in Norway about Telenor's uh, responsibility out there. And it, was, it wasn't possible to get a business class ticket for Dhaka for the next two years or so. They sent out so many consultants and clean up people that uh, there was, uh, you couldn't, there were Norwegians all over the place. They uh, also admitted later on that uh, they made uh, one monthly inspections on each and every of the factories that is supplying them. And they have supplied them for 10 years at, that at, this, at this time. So uh, 120 visits by independent auditors had visited the factories. And we asked them, and Norwegian media asked them, so how many remarks did these 120 visits add up to, you know, if, if the, if the uh, independent auditors from the working uh, control in Norway went through this hotel, they would probably have 20, 50 remarks on some exhaustion that doesn't work or some uh, dripping water post or something electrical that is not functioning well. In Bangladesh, in 10 years, 120 visits, zero remarks. And that sort of flipped them totally over there in, in Norway. And there was a very funny, also there was a press conference. I wasn't attending, I was back in Denmark, but there was a, a press conference where the CEO of Telenor, uh, at that time, Baxos, his name was, he was sitting in the middle, I think, and then there was like two or three communication advisors to the company, and they were all sitting with their cell phones, and, and there were a lot of journalists, and there were a lot of camera crews, 
and uh, she said like in 200 different ways, sorry, we have to clean up, sorry, thank you for Tom Heinemann for opening our eyes, blah, 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 blah. And of course, uh, some journalists ask, can we then come and see the improvements of your factories? Yes, there will be no, anyone can come and visit uh, the factories and our suppliers. And um, then uh, I think it was TV2 in Norway the, who actually had a, a film crew standing outside Confident Steel in outside Dhaka. And she was, I think it was a girl, female journalist, was like, Mr. Baxos, the CEO, I have a, I have a film crew standing outside Confident Steel. They cannot be let in. Can we do something about this, Mr. Baxos? And they were like, all these four communications people were sitting with their phones trying to sort this new problem. So that's, that was a quite a funny, uh, a spectacular story in Norway. And the funny thing is that it didn't hit very hard in Sweden. Sweden has another, uh, yeah. Did the airplane go down? Down again? Sorry? Did the airplane go uh, down? Yeah, you did it. I do plug Gansling. Karin Mattison, uh, the, the anchor, she had to, uh, and we, they, I worked with them very closely so that they would confront the uh, head of communication at Ericsson's. But initially he, initially he denied anything. And they said, we're going to investigate this. And it can't be true. And then they came back and said, well, it is true. And we have a problem. But it didn't hit the, the Swedish media as much as it hit the Norwegian media, which is quite funny because there's sort of difference in morality or value chains or whatever. Okay, who can you cheat and who can you not cheat? And it was quite an experience. I have been told that you must s say something in a microphone. Okay. Taye, no, you're free to interrupt me, just as long as we get it on microphone, I've been told. No, sorry, thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I just got so interested in everything. I, I've done similar stuff for Finnwatch in Finland for years. <laughs> uh, anyway, but um, did you co-publish so that you published or came out with a story in Denmark and Sweden at the same time? Or was there a time lag so that they would have had to sort of follow on from your your story of when you came out in Den in, Hol uh, in Norway, I mean. Yeah, we, we uh, I haven't had the success in, in like saying boom in three countries at one time. Uh, I, don't, I, I don't think I'll ever manage to do so, but, but of course, technically speaking, we could do that. But it's a matter of programming, planning, and many of the TV stations, they have like six months ahead. And do we clear, clear the sheet and say, we're going to air this film because Norway is... That doesn't work. But normally I also try to help the local, I'm a Dane, but I also work for Norwegian television and Swedish television. So what I'd normally is trying to do is to sort of sharp angle it for them. So that, be, and because of the format of uh, the Swedish Uppdrag Kranskning, which is a documentary slot, um, they, have a, they have a format of, is it 45 minutes? One hour. One hour, but in between there's sort of, it can be cut in several pieces, and then you have a, a confrontation, debate with the, the anchor and the, the villain of the villains. Or, and in Norway, they like a, maybe a 50-minute slot, and in Denmark, they want a 58-30, like a one-hour slot. So I have to adjust to that if I, if I want to be, um, uh, if I need to, to and I need, need to have more broadcasters than one, because one doesn't never want to pay what it costs to do a documentary like this. So I have to add in a lot of, a lot of things. Microphone, please. Yes. Thank you, Taye. Uh, just um, a precision. How did you know these kids were uh, under 15? Because I can see on the letter here that the guy is contesting, so he's got a point here. Did you have any evidence that they were under yeah, 15? In, in the actual film, we, we have uh, their age. We have interviews with them in the local villages, and they... They show their working book, how many hours they work, and how much their salary is. And uh, we also uh, we also interviewed the um, uh, a big NGO in, in Bangladesh dealing with uh, with um, law making of environmental laws and work related laws. And uh, they were uh, there is a law in Bangladesh, running machines as they call it, dangerous things. You have to be 18 or above. Um, Less, uh, less dangerous work, you can work down to 14. But under 14, 
there is no such thing in Bangladesh. Of course there is. You can find them all over. But you, of course you have to prove it. But these children were way under 18. Some of them were 12. And this is uh, so, so sort of a, so just a, a basic uh, confrontation. Um, here I admit that I went to Confidence Deal under another name. And I admit that I was pulling them a leg or whatever. But that still justify, doesn't justify that I don't confront them in my real name. So I did here. And uh, this is just an extract of a long, long, long mail back and forth. And his reply is in yes, uh, is, in, is in red, where he denies that they have child workers inside the factory. There were child workers all over the factory. He denied that they had this uh, tower erection uh, where they, people were crawling up in 40 meters height without any security measures. But that was another company, he claimed. And anyone could see, a blind man could see with a stick that there was something wrong here. So it bollocks, you know. But we had to tell that in the film, and so we did. He claims that so and so and so. And just recently, um, I found another little funny thing on Confidence Steel's website. Now they are a star performer by Grameen Phone, which is owned by Telenor, the state-owned uh, telephone company in uh, Norway. And now they are a star performer in the ABC compliance. I don't know what that means. Um, but they have a, uh, they have a, in recognition for their outstanding performance in terms of social compliance in quarter one and two, 2013, signed Arne Viggo Arendsen, head of sourcing and supply chain sustainability in Grameen Phone, which is the largest telephone company in Bangladesh. I don't trust this. And this is another proof that we should save on your laptop and go back to Confidence Steel and sneak in again, because I'm sure we could do the same story one more time. But are the editors interested in that? I don't know. But for me, it is. Tom, are you taking more questions or waiting until afterwards? No, uh, we, can, we can take some questions. We are shifting gear anyway now. So. Uh, Hi, thank you. Uh, I don't know if you're going to uh, talk about this later on, but um, can you see something about how you secure the data? Once you're in the country and you're doing interviews and you're filming and taking photos, how do you keep that data safe before you leave? I'll come back to that in a second. I have a slide of that, I think. But first, uh, we also took a swing with the, the fair trade movement, which is supposed to be good. This is a film I made with, uh, with Erling, my colleague and old friend, Erling Borgen, who is here. It was called The Bitter Taste of Tea and was about how, uh, how tea was actually made. And the, the story here is actually also an example on uh, quantitative journalism can lead to what we find is qualitative uh, journalism. Uh, and this is, again, by the amount of interviews we made, the amount of countries we traveled to and asked the same questions to the same, to various people in different countries and by that in other different cultures and languages. But anyway, when you add this up, you have a large quantity of interviews that you will not be able to use in your film but it gives you a certainty of what you're doing is right. So you pick, of course, that's our privilege. You edit it down to a film in uh, 58 minutes. But again, uh, I cannot just, we can't just travel to Sri Lanka, India, Kenya, and Bangladesh, Erling and me. We are both freelancers. So we need somebody to do this for us. And here's a long mail for, for Mr. Madhavan, our very good common friend in India, who's a photojournalist and do write me if you need a good fixer in India. He is brilliant. He's fearless, sometimes a little, uh, a little, uh, yeah, a little madman. Um, but he shall not please me. He shall be taking care of himself. And we discuss this, of course. Um, and here's basically what I'm asking him as an initial mail. We will do this story. Can you help us investigate in India? There's the fair trade movement, but also we need to establish the route from a Lipton tea bag, the largest tea brand in the world, owned by Unilever, the largest food production company in the world, has ever seen so far. So can we prove beyond reasonable doubt that this tea bag comes from this estate where they treat people like slaves or have, have almost killed them? And especially the... The fair trade movement was very interesting for us. So Madhavan went off. Normally I pay Madhavan 
between 75 and 100 dollars a day and normally i do sort of a fixed price i say judged on the amount of traveling of course pay his travel expenses but the amount of work plus the re research report he comes with and he always does them very well should amount to 10 days meaning a thousand dollars and any one of us can of course pay a thousand dollars to get a report like this that would probably cost me $25,000 to do it myself. And I have no, my program is not sold yet. There is no money for this. So we have to sort of add in. And what we did, but he, he comes with a lot of interesting remarks about fair trade against the Unilever Lipton tracks, tracks. And our idea when we initially began this research was that, well, fair trade must be good, meaning Unilever Lipton are bad. But that's not how the world is working. And fair trade turned out to be, to my point of view, even worse, because they promised even more than Unilever does. And they wouldn't lie down. They fought us up to 24 hours before the airing of the program and uh, made my editor in National Danish Television so shit scared that he uh, ended believing in me. So I had to have a really, 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 I turned yellow and uh, we had a lot of fight. And finally, he found out they are lying. They lied to us, and they repeatedly lied to us. Um, anyway, so fair trade isn't that fair what they used to be. And here we are again, sort of an example on a quantity, quantitative uh, question because we are traveling to other countries and asking the same question. And this is about fair trade. <laughs> Pengalik itu indah, beli urut lantai kasih itu nak ke, kaya lebih tak kasih. Ada macam itu, nangga kata kita nampol ni. Yang orang macam itu kumpulte, nangga kau orang komite orang pada pernah. Indah komite lalu nangga talar orang pada pernah, nangga sel ala orang pada pernah. Seringnya lah, tu nangga kasih itu perpanjang orang nangga pernah. Apa ini enggak lelai orang tu kumpulan mem, abang lelai tak tenar terkang. For working. Uh, some 11, 13 hours a day for a fair trade tea estate must pluck 17 kilo kilograms of tea leaves of the finest quality, treated like hell, living in a slave-like conditions, and after nine years she received a thermo and a laundry basket as a premium. That's what fair trade are paying the tea workers in Sri Lanka. No. So, we have this. Now it's getting really good. So, India, we have to build the documentation as strong as possible. So we had to go to India. I cannot go to India. I have been banned to go to India for the last nine years or so. I can never get a visa to India anymore. So here's another trick. When you have a good friend like Madhavan, Madhavan also have friends who can run a camera. It's just a matter of finding the right persons. And then you send out your exact questions to Madhavan. He should not ask anything more or anything less. He should ask the same question as I would have done. And he can do this. And you, you have to rely on this. So we did this on this way. So. Fair trade require the plantations to ensure that some of the extra premium that the consumers pay for fair trade tea is put back into the plantations. This tea is produced by this Indian fair trade estate and sold by, among others, Coop. Hmm. So that's uh, 
That's a way to do it, the quantitative journalism that can lead to what I believe in qualitative journalism. Uh, Carbon Crooks is another story I did. Um, here, I didn't have a fixer uh, in that sense. So can, can you trust the information that you can pay for by hiring an NGO working specifically on uh, workers' rights and uh, safety and uh, things like that? So, well, I can, and I trust them. I have talked to them before. Uh, of course, they have an agenda, and I have to sort of research in their motives. But uh, again, I asked them to, to go and check a lot of uh, factories producing bricks. And uh, there are eight factories producing bricks in a so-called climate project uh, run by the UN. And I needed them to go to all the eight factories because I needed, again, this. the quantity leads to me being safe and sound in proving my story. So, um, so this uh, specific NGO is a Bangladeshi Occupational Safety, Health and Environmental Foundation. But they, uh, they have a good track record. And uh, if you Google them, you will see that they, uh, they can do solid work. So I got a report, and it was a very long report. There was small reports on each and every factory about work, uh, all the questions that I've asked them uh, here. Um, are workers uh, treated better than anywhere else, as they claim in the documents, is uh, workers provided with all necessary protective clothing, blah, blah, blah. It's hot to burn a brick. It's hard work. Uh, and there's a lot of dust and there's a lot of uh, and dangerous dust from coal. Um, so we, we got a ex very extensive report, but basically confirming our story is that there is something absolutely wrong in these UN uh, supported factories. Thing is that when Denmark had the uh, climate summit, the COP15, um, it was measured how many uh, tons of carbon emissions that would cost uh, extra on the Danish account. And by making the COP15 the first carbon neutral summit, they had to buy thousands of carbon credits in a project. And they took this project. Um, the smokeless factories in Bangladesh. And I have certainly seen many factories in Bangladesh, but I've never seen a smokeless one. I had to see that. They, when the UN says so, it must be true. To make the summit in Copenhagen climate neutral, the Danish government bought credits in a CDM project here in Bangladesh. The project was to reduce carbon emissions in the production of bricks. Of the country's 6,000 brick factories, eight factories have introduced a new technology that reduces emissions. The United Nations has named them smokeless factories. There it is. Yeah, well, the, the, the then... Uh, Commissioner, uh, uh, Commissioner for the Environment, Connie Hildegard, in the EU Commission, she had, already, she had also visited one of these factories, and we found some brilliant shots on the EU website with her visiting them. So we confronted her with that. But that's another story. Um, I have two things that I like also to discuss today with you, because that's, that's also an ethical discussion. I normally always traveling on a tourist visa. I have some good arguments for that. I will show you some of the backs and forth. But it can also have some, some consequences that is not very good. Um, because if you are traveling on a tourist visa, you are probably violating most countries' uh, immigration laws, where they demand that if you are working in any way, you have to sort of label that. And um, Bangladesh has a very nice system called Visa on Arrival, it takes uh, $50 in your passport and go to the diplomat queue because there's no queue there and they will let you in. Um, India is another thing. We have never, never ever since we made a story out there on the textile production, we have never, both my wife and me, uh, been able to get a visa there. We have uh, applied many times and they print uh, a stamp in our passport saying VAF visa application failed. That's as close as saying, here's a potential terrorist. So you throw away your passport. 
the uh, T story led to that there was an issued an arrest warrant uh, by the National T Board of Sri Lanka, or it's called National T Board of Salem, that because we uh, were trespassing their immigration laws, that was their excuse for issuing a, a letter to all the T estates in Sri Lanka saying that if I was seen again my, with my full name as well as my wife's name, uh, we should be uh, detained with necessary force until proper authorities should come and take over. That was more or less exactly what it said. It also led to some threats in Bangladesh. And, and, uh, but on the other hand, I am not keen on contacting my embassy wherever I go, because embassies has is a sort of a two-edged sword. They are there to maintain the good relationship with the country involved. They are there to promote Danish or Norwegian or whatever their country is. Their business life, uh, they have uh, they have to close their eyes sometimes. And when you come as a journalist and uh, demanding that for help and whatever, it's not very good. They don't like it. Actually, the embassies are quite, they quite like that you don't uh, travel on a, on a sort of a official status. Um, I have this story. If some of you want to hear this uh, in details, I will gladly give it to anyone who can travel freely in China. I have a dynamite story there. I was denied to go there because Danish National Television's ethical director said to me, what? Have you made a new identity? Have you presented yourself as being a mercury dealer in Manila, wanting to buy mercury in China by five known companies? Yes, I said, and I'm going to these companies and I'm going to expose them how they violated not only Chinese law, but also international law, Filipino law, any law uh, they are violating. And I can prove this. Yes, but you cannot go without a, a journalist visa. And I said, in China, if I want to have a journalist visa for China, I'm going to tell them, who am I going to talk to? What's my synopsis? Uh, who am I going to travel with? Who is my fixer? Where will I be staying? What will I be doing? How long will I be doing this? You'll never get a visa there. It's too embarrassing for, for China. They will never give me a visa. It's, yeah. So, and basically when I'm traveling as a tourist, I always have a, some sort of a neat cover story. I can be, a, as said before, a research scientist from a, co from a university that doesn't exist uh, either on my paper, or I can be a... Like in, in uh, Swaziland, in this last year, I was uh, very, very interested in seeing the wildlife. And therefore, we had some small cameras uh, that we hardly used because that was too dangerous for the people that we worked with. And there's the consequences, as I said. Um, it's not possible to do, uh, to my point of view, in very few countries, doing really, truly independent journalism on a journalist visa. If you look through what they demand of you to tell them, either you should be really good in lying and persuade them uh, that you are not who you are or whatever. And, and finally, also, because that you probably must tell them where you're staying and who you are accompanying with, you are endangering your sources, you are endangering your fixers. Um, one of the first, uh, the last places that I had to apply for a journalist visa was to Egypt. We did a story in the series that Erling and I did with a woman who was gang raped at the Tahir Square. And um, she was the first Egyptian woman who stood up with name and face and said that we got to do something about this. It was a horrible story. We needed footage of her in the streets in the Tahir Square where she was raped by a group of men. Um, so we, and because of the situation in Egypt right now is that if you are the same color as me and you are filming in the streets, you are most definitely an Al Jazeera spy uh, working for Morsi and his companions at the Muslim Brotherhood. And many, many examples on, on camera crews has been uh, harassed and intimidated and smashed up their cameras, either by the police or by locals. So we had to have a visa. We got the visa. It took a long time, I tell you, long time three weeks or something like that. And then we went to the streets to film, and we even have an o had an overcoat with us, a man from the Ministry of Interior with a huge stack of papers with all the proper papers that allowed us to film. 
we went to the infamous street, Mohammed Mahmoud Street, that leads up to Tahir Square, where she was gang raped so m for 70 minutes, this young woman. And we wanted her to walk on the street, stand, look over the, the, uh, the Tahir Square. Three minutes we had, then the police came, stopped us, and not threatening us, but the civil servant who was actually trying to help us because he should be there. He was intimidated like hell, and we had to stop. Three minutes, that was what we got. And then again, just, fi if just to finish this slide, um, if you have a passport, then you should have two passports, because if you have a journalist visa, let's say for China, it fills a whole page in your passport, then you cannot go to another country saying, I'm a tourist, because they will look through. So either you have two passports or you throw away your passport all the time. That's, of course, around 100 euros every time. But that could be worthwhile because if many of, some of you may be traveling a lot and had, have had journalist visas, they're all stamped in there. There are all kinds of stamps in your passport. And uh, that's not good. So either have two passports or throw away and give another one. Yes, let's have a few questions. We got... Something like, what, 10 minutes left? Yeah. All right, I have two questions. The first is uh, if you could uh, answer the question that Runa asked earlier about how you secure, uh, not your sources, but your information, hard drives yeah. and, uh, while you travel. That's the first question. Uh, second question is about, you have been speaking about uh, having fake identities and uh, uh, how has, I mean, uh, for us, uh, where I work, uh, there's a lot of discussion before we put on a fake identity because uh, of the public's trust. I mean, if I d make a documentary and it's uh, obvious that I've, I've tricked these persons in Bangladesh or wherever, yeah. uh, then that would inflict on the trust uh, in the program. So what's your thought on that? Um, I always make three copies of my work. Uh, locally, and I save one uh, hard drive out there. So if I'm stopped at the airport or somebody is uh, doing something, I have an extra hard disk. And that's also a little present for my local fixer because when I'm back home, safe and sound, I ask him to erase the whole thing and he's got a, a fine 500 gig hard disk. So that's good. Uh, yes, there is a lot of ethical discussions in this. And I also agree with, uh, with the more Puritan way of thinking that we cannot use this hidden camera anymore as a, as a gadget or as a trick to do uh, uh, certain specialities. But sometimes it's really necessary. Sometimes you cannot live without it. But being as, uh, as subjective as I am as a journalist, because there is no objective journalism, but being as sub subjective as I am, uh, I have made it my brand to be a the most fair and square journalist that, that I can come up with. And that means that I present everything, not just, can you comment on this? No. If, a, if a 10 ladies in a village in Bangladesh tells me that uh, Mohammed Yunus's uh, Grameen Bank that was supposed to give them a, a good uh, microcredit loan, and when they say they are feeling defrauded or their document shows that, then I present everything for Mr. Mohammed Yunus. Uh, and that justifies that, that I can also uh, take another identity if necessary. And I think we should fight for this. I know it's, ethically speaking, can be a little troublesome, but I think it's, it must be a part of our toolbox. To that. that's some of the shots that, uh, <coughs> My camera wasn't big enough that I could zoom in and show child labors. And my camera was not powerful enough to show how they actually mm. stove these uh, iron things down in this 200. And so I, I think I can justify that. But that's a good discussion. And uh, we should have that with our editors before we leave. That, like, where's the limits? Where can I, where can I go? And to finalize this also is that, well, to me, 
my network out there is the most important thing, and I maintain it very well. I call them, I write them, I give them presents, and I send them all kinds of things if I'm able to do so. My sister-in-law often travels to India, um, so she brings presents for Madhavan and for my old driver, and so I keep, and you should do that also, because they are so valuable for us, all of us. You had a question? Um, yeah, thank you. I'd like to follow up on the question about the use of um, undercover identity and uh, hidden camera. I'm a producer myself, so I have crews travel as well. Um, first of all, I think that uh, it could put the reporter in danger as well. So um, first question maybe is that, what if you get caught with the hidden camera in a country like Egypt? Um, do you, are you taking any measure, contacting a legal attorney before uh, running? That's a very practical question. Um, uh, secondly, I'm a bit surprised that it seems that um, in the first thing you showed, it, you, it seems you assume from the beginning that you'll go undercover. Uh, in our case, um, I would say that first we would try all legal contacts and uh, we would send emails and uh, ask for interviews and normal shooting and then only afterwards, as a last resort, which is supposed to be the ethical use of hidden camera and undercover, uh, as a last resort, we would, we would uh, use that kind of, of method. It seems that you do assume from the beginning that you're going to go undercover. And I'm not very sure, I'm not very comfortable with that. And, and the fact that, for instance, in India, uh, you, um, you cannot travel anymore. I, I just wonder if I in the long term, you know, uh, once you've done so many films in all sorts of places and, and uh, nobody wants you anymore. <laughs> if in, in no, but I mean, if in, the, in the long term, I'm, I wonder if this is rational. And uh, I, I still believe that we should encourage our teams to work um, in the spirit of confidence and trust and only as the last resort go undercover with hidden cameras. I'm interested to have your observations, Matt. Well, basically... So I think it, it's not just an ethical debate like another. It's no. absolutely fundamental. Basically, I agree with you, but that's, that's got to be sorted out before you leave. And uh, your fixer will tell you, is it a place where uh, journalists are welcome? Is it a place where foreigners often come? Is it a place like all these discussions we have in advance? Um, I'm not so Puritan like you. Uh, I would say that, that the means justify sometimes that I do it in another way. But that doesn't mean that I don't... Uh, I'm very, I have very high standard when it comes to get the ones I criticize to get them, their word, uh, on paper or on camera afterwards. I'm known for that being rather fair journalist. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm a little bit harsh on uh, uh, business life in Scandinavia, but uh, that's the price they're going to pay when they want to deal with me. So I, I can't say I, I disagree with you, but I can't honestly say that I totally agree with you. I think it's uh, from time to time you have to take these decisions. It's too dangerous to go get in uh, as a journalist. And I risk to intimidate my fixer. After the telecom story, um, I was, we was, uh, Erling and I actually helped each other by doing a follow-up, a short follow-up, because a lot of, some of the factory owners were actually fired by Telenor. And then they came to us and said, you have ruined our lives. And we actually made that public so that Telenor had to withdraw their firing of a subcontractor. So they suddenly owed us something. They were deeply grateful for us to bring this attention on. And by that, we also got to know that, that uh, which consequences does it have when you do like this. And I think it can justify many things. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying I'm 100% on this. It's a discussion that you must take in between. Have you got time for two more questions? Yes, 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 yes. More or less, uh, security assessments on all crew members. Said was, uh, they asked for his name and telephone number. And I said his name was Ra Ramia, Ra Rashid, I think his name was. And he was just a driver, an interpreter. He wasn't our, because they named him as our, our, our partner in Bangladesh. And we have never said that to, to any factory owners. But telling that to Said, and I said, Said, don't go out in this area. It was like one and a half hours out of Dhaka, where these factory areas are lying. 
And he said, no, 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 I know. I'm not going to go out there the next six months. Otherwise, they will chop me up. So you, you have this discussion all the time. And that's part of lessons learned, is that you do a thorough security assessment. Uh, I, I haven't got time to tell you a tragic story with Madhu, Madhuan that went totally wrong because of Swedish television. <laughs> Let me take a question. Okay. Yes, I was wondering, uh, you t speak about the security of the crew, but um, I, were there full names of those people, full proper names of the people you interviewed in the factory, the workers? Yeah. Okay. They were, were they former workers. Did you? Oh, I see, they were former workers. Yeah. Uh -huh. they so were, they were, and they were also activists. They were trying to improve the situation. Okay, so they were ready to they pay a cost. Yeah, of course. Otherwise, I wouldn't have named them or have put a sack over their head or something like that. Okay. And what if Copenhagen University would have found out that you have used their ID or... Uh, yeah. I don't care. Okay, fine. <laughs> Absolutely don't care. Yes, there's one down there. Uh, well, sorry. Oh, sorry. Hi, Tom. It's great to uh, see your work and have you talk about it. I think I just wanted to add one thing. I'm not a journalist and I am a lawyer. And oh. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, terrible. Um, but I work with whistleblowers. And I think one of the things that strikes me that is part of why we need to think about our ethics clearly is because the systems of um, non, um, what is it, on the spot um, inspections have stopped. Right? So all those regulators we relied on to actually turn up when no one expected. They all came once a month when everyone got their hats and their shirts on. Um, so the, the ethics now have to take into a broader, you know, you do things because those other people are not doing their jobs. And as a lawyer, yeah, I have all those ethical concerns, but ethics and actually the greater responsibility in this is that unless we show what ought to be done, which is there should be on the spot inspections, we can only do it when we take a, uh, and mm. we're taking all the mm. risks that you should be, should be doing anyway. And, we, and the younger generation of journalists who are being raised in systems where they follow all the rules, by the way, <laughs> um, you know, uh, are really shocked. You can't, you can't commit any crime. Mm. And it's you have to think through what you mean by that. What is any crime? What is going for the information? So although you would think I would be more strong, I actually think we need some of that bravery. We need the discussions and we Let need to... Let me just add to that that I have been sued or threatened with lawsuits all over the world, more or less. I have so far never lost a case because I also act very ethically speaking in the aftermath that I present all my critique. I don't have any hidden agendas or what about this document in the middle of an interview? I don't do that. I think that's unethical. But that's a matter of, but I have, they have tried the best, many, many, many companies have tried their best to, to either sue me or shut me up and they haven't succeeded and they hopefully never will. Um, I had some few more tricks here. Uh, Another thing that we learned from a lot of law criticism or law firms uh, complaining about my programs is that uh, normally when you do an interview, either it's on, on print or on tape, you normally tape the interview, but, but just not before when you have chit-chatted with your source, right? You normally sit down and, oh, how are you and how was your day? And yes, I'm really happy that you want to give this interview to me and and Lord is standing with the camera and measuring and blah, 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 and you are sitting, and you are not turning your dictaphone on. And that can be crucial in a lawsuit, because did you actually say who you was? And that's, of course, not in part of the program, but it's on the tape. And I have actually shut up some lawyers by saying, no, I did not play another role. I said who I was, and you, if you rewind the tape, you will actually see the man from selling these chemicals, he's sitting with my business card. You can actually see the business card. And if you zoom in on it, and that has silenced some law firms that wanted to take me on being unethical, proving that I was something else that I wasn't. Um, so that I've learned, and that's a good trick. Start the camera, let it run. It doesn't matter. There's plenty of tapes and plenty of time on the cards today. So let it run. And... Um, Another thing, if you want to be global, you have to respect that some countries, they want written consent declaration or affidavits or whatever you call it on each and every character you bring in your film. Like, if I want to sell a film for the UK market, 
I have to present to all the people involved in the film, there must be a written consent. Yes, I have freely participated in Tom Heinemann's filmmaking, and I gave my interview freely and voluntarily, and I didn't receive any money. Full stop. Signed. Remember that when you're out there in the bushes, and you sit there and, oh, fuck, I forgot to get this consent declaration. So next day you have to go back through the bushes and find the family again and say, sign here, please. So make that into, make them pre-print it from back home, half a page, something. It doesn't fill that much. Get the signature. It's, it can be very valuable at the end. Um, yeah. And finally, you can read more on the films here and... Uh, and our brand new series, the, the one in below, is, uh, is another part of my life now, doing uh, human rights television, whatever. I'm fine. You're fine? We are, I think we have, let's see, we have two more minutes, then we are over doing it. Quick. Have you ever made a test how much you make in an hour? <laughs> have no. you ever calculated that through what, I mean, is it... Um, do you have a business model? Because you've talked a lot about you can't go yourself, which I find very dangerous yeah. because um, I've worked with a lot of stringers too. Yeah. And I usually want to see what I report on and I want to be there. And, and you made evident that it's not possible. So there are some economic ex uh, constraints. And That's the only thing I'm not good at. It's a business model. I've never invented that. And I don't know how to do it. And I know how many hours I work, but I don't count them. Otherwise, I think I would go in a deep depression. But I love my work, and I only do what I love to do. So, so I'm on the one side privileged of only doing the stories that are really turn me on. And I go for a more fair and square world to live in than what I see with my own eyes when I get out there. But, but rich or, or just half rich or just forget it. And... and it has not become easier. No. Well, it has certainly, and not to brag too much, but I have a name. They know me up here. They know me in Denmark. They know me in Norway. They know me in Sweden. They should rely on that. I, when I come with an idea, I deliver. I, I don't stop in the middle and say, oh, you just spent 100,000 euros on nothing. I couldn't. It was just research. It, did, it failed. I don't do that. I invest a lot of time and money initially to be sure that I can make the story. But that doesn't mean, with my long experience, that I can go in and cash out and just say, yes, I'm off next week. No, I spent more than half the time producing a documentary is trying to raise the money. These endless, endless writing and waiting and emailing and pitching and I, I wouldn't dream of saying to a 25-year-old new journalist, become a freelance filmmaker. Unless you want to live on a houseboat like I do and have very low costs every month. And my children have moved from home and everything is good. But, but it's not... But I love my work. And now what can I say? If I couldn't do this job, I would go back to my old job. I used to be a bricklayer. I used to build houses. And that's a fine job. And it's a really honest job. My back can't, but I could do bathrooms then. Something like that. Yes? Um, a question and a comment. Ooh. The comment is, I was working actually in India um, as a journalist, but for an Indian newspaper. Um, but I'm foreigner for them, for sure. So to get the visa for this internship, actually, uh, was also already hard. It was just an internship. But for sure, they saw Washi Times. It's a newspaper. It's So, you know, it's for India, it's really hard. They don't want foreign journalists got involved in their stuff, so it's really hard to get a visa, actually. And the thing is, uh, the other thing, the question is actually, you said uh, this about this written consents yeah. to get it printed out with you and taken to the country where you go to. The problem I see is, is it not, it's just valid if it's in the language they understand and if they are illiterate. It means if they can read and write. If they cannot read and write, it's not valid. No. Uh, belong the right, uh, belong the law, isn't it? Probably, but it it will shut up the uh, the lawyers normally. But couldn't they argue that uh, they didn't even understand what they were signing? Yes. Let me give you an example. Uh, the man who talked about fair trade in Sri Lanka, this little man with a hat on, 
Fairtrade afterwards claimed that he was duped by me in telling bad things about Fairtrade because I represented it, something they invented in the Fairtrade movement. So, <coughs> and this guy, I hadn't at that time any consent declaration with him. I had to hire a lawyer in Sri Lanka, I was back in Denmark, to go out and meet my fixer that could take him to this particular tea estate and in two languages write a written affidavit saying, yes, Tom Heinemann was a journalist I met, he's a great guy, and I said uh, what I said, and I fully stand up behind that. But I had to, and it cost me like 500 euros or something to do that, but to shut up, to shut up the lawyers from, from fair trade movement in Denmark as well as in Germany, we had to do that. And I just wanted to say to you now, prepare yourself from back home. And if you need to write it in Hindi, or your fixer can do that, and so that he is signing in a language he understands, or she. But you're right. It's, of course, many of the people you talk to are illiterates. They, you can print your finger here, or whatever. Uh, silly. But, but it's necessary. Think the time is more or less gone? Yeah. Yes, it, I, would say, I would say it's good enough to have it on camera. But not all of you are TV people, right? So, but you can have your iPhone or you can have a dictaphone. Maybe you can... Uh, I don't actually know if that's valid. Uh, but I would say it is. But sometimes paperwork is also nice when you have uh, Clifford Charge after you, world's biggest law firm. Then it's nice to have paperwork. Right, thank you very much.